afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it is my uh, pleasure to uh, give you a talk on uh, what very little I know about carbonatites and their roots. And one of the reasons is that carbonatites are a highly controversial topic in terms of science. And, uh, and because of these controversies, I found it extremely fascinating. And uh, that being the case, I got in lock, stock, and barrel to do a good lock in amongst all the other long stock and barrels in my life, of course. Now, this copperhead carbonatite is the first time I came across a carbonatite in Australia, in Western Australia, and that was in 1992, together with uh, um, Craig Douglas. We came across it quite by mistake. It was an accident. But there it is. It's a small carbonatite. Um, as far as we know, it has yet unmineralized, or we will know in terms of mineralization. Now, carbonatites exist in Carbonatites form plug-like intrusions, small subvolcanic intrusions, veins, dikes, and are associated with alkaline mineral complexes. And of course, carbonatites are a major repository of rare earth minerals. Now, the main consumers of rare earths, I guess you probably know that already, the China, <coughs> USA, Japan, Korea, and Thailand, and Thailand and China reportedly account for about 60% of the total resources. Now, this is dates back in 2010, but that does give you an idea of the distribution of the resources of the Earth in the world. Um, like I said, the 2010 has probably changed by now, but the change would be pretty small. It's more, more or less what you see here. It's quite okay. Okay, now, rare Earth elements, what are they? In case there are people here that may not know too much about it, it says 17 elements in a periodic table, which exhibit similar chemical properties. And the term rare earth, funnily enough, is not because they are rare, not at all, it's got nothing to do with it. That rare earth elements are found in relatively high concentration in the earth's crust, in fact, the cerium being the 25th most abundant element in the crust. <coughs> and also, in case, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, like we got two, two, two slots of rare earths, light rare earths and heavy rare earths. I won't go into the details because you have the printout for that. Now, the other thing is rare earth minerals, hosting lithologist, leaves us from uh, Anton, and uh, we have bustinocyte, is probably the most important one, cinchicite, monazite, uh, xenotine, and so forth. And these are the basic um, uh, minerals which contain the rare earth elements. And what are rare earths used for? Well, uh, fluorescent lights, hybrid vehicles, uh, wind turbines, cutters, <coughs> converters, diesel activities, flat panel displays, digital cameras, and mobile phones, of course. And uh, one of the funny things is when I was in China visiting Bayanoto, uh, I, I asked my Chinese colleague, and this is about four years ago, five years ago, why rare earths are so, so important in China, why everybody's looking for rare earths in China, why are they closing into rare earths? And he told me, do you know how many mobile phones we have in China? I said, no. The statistics show that we have 850 million mobile phones. I stopped here. Okay? It's mind-boggling. But there you go. Now, <coughs> distribution of rare earths deposits in the world. Um, this is a map compiled by Sidney Morinka, uh, it's a meteorological survey. And it gives you an idea of the distribution. As you can see, Australia is pretty well endowed with um, uh, rare earth deposits. And of course, South Africa and North America and China and the Kola Peninsula and of course, South America. <coughs> now, what are these things? So let's, let's look at a bit more detail. This is from Nadir published in 1987. <coughs> it's an idealized methylenetic carbonatitic volcano deponic complex. And basically, what it shows is that you have, okay, you have the servite, which is effectively a calcite rich uh, carbonatite with a halo of phonetic alteration, uh, phonetic, oops, a halo of phonetic alteration, and of course this can or cannot erupt as a volcano, um, which is the case of uh, Odonia Lengari, obviously. But the important thing to remember that there are several levels of erosion that you must take into account when looking at these carbonatites. I'll put here four usually um, common erosion levels necessarily, so anything in between can occur. Right, so let's 
move on to the next one. Um, now, also, there are six, several features. There is an evolutionary trends of the silicates and carbonated magmas. Usually, they occur together initially, and then they separate because of immiscibility. And this immiscibility is quite dramatic, as you will see in some of the next, uh, next few slides that I will show. But the bottom line is that you have on one side, you <coughs> have the um, uh, silicate uh, of alkaline magma disc, and on the other side, you have the carbonate magma disc. The other thing I want to point out is that quite often, in, in, on the way up to carbonate magma disc, you can get apatite cumulates. And Mount Weld, by the way, has a beautiful example of apatite cumulates, as you will see shortly. Right, in Western Australia, uh, let's look at, um, at um, Gippo Creek, uh, Government Art Complex, and the Mount Weld. Right, Gippo Creek. Uh, this is quite a, a, a strange beast, if you like. And it, it consists of a number of ferrocarbonatite seals and dikes up along the Lyons River Fault. And then these are overprinted, or at least intersected by, uh, oops, uh, the, the by, uh, um, by ironstone veins, which are associated, which is uh, simply the, the alteration of the ferrocarbonate. But this is a second event, because as you can see, some of these ironstone veins actually cut across the original ferrocarbonate, therefore uh, suggesting that they be later. And this is corroborated by a lady. But before I do that, um, this is a general a courtesy, a image cultivated border for missing resources, instigated metals, and it, it gives you an idea of the resources at, that we know of at the moment in the, in, in the um, Gipple Creek. But I know that for now they're busy drilling again, and therefore quite likely these resources will be increased in the near future. Sorry? They were really, yeah, well, that's the thing. They released one, and then six months from now, they release more, and all these things change all the time. But nevertheless, it gives you an idea of what we need to do. Um, this is the, uh, the, the photomicrographs of uh, our ferrocarbonate, and it shows beautifully well iron carbon uh, globules, which is shown as number one, and, and the, and the uh, silicate material. These are, it, are a feature of of uh, two invisibility. So you got the, it starts off as together and then they, they become invisible and you got carbon at the one end and silicate at the other end. And you see more of it. When we come to age dating, we did an apatite dating and the monazite dating, and we have two ages, uh, 1075 and 1050. Uh, please look at the, at the uh, error, 3, uh, 1075 plus or minus 31 and 1050 plus or minus 24. What does that mean? Well, it, it's the exact age of the Waracuna large igneous province, 1050, 1075. What it is actually related to the Waracuna, it's a matter of, matter of uh, discussion. Nevertheless, it's most carbonatized, most carbonatized, if not all, are associated with large igneous provinces. So it's a good idea or a good model that this may be part of the Waracuna large igneous provinces. There it is, it sits there. And that's the extent of the province. So we have perhaps two, two ages of carbonatite. The first one is the ferrocarbonatite along the lines with coal, and then 1050 overprinted by a second set of carbonatite, this time uh, uh, altered to iron, um, iron oxide, which are the iron oxide that we now see in the field. Mount Weld. Uh, Mount Weld is essentially a uh, it's certainly carbonatite, but the minimization is associated with the lateral cap at the top. This is, the, you see the bottom here, the, um, the magnetic image, which is quite dramatic, as you can see, you can, you can miss that. And that's what it looks like in the field. I was there two years ago, and we looked at it, it was very interesting. This is, of course, is the, the lateral cap, which has the minimization, the apatite minimization. But when you look at the, oh, sorry. And the Mount Weld is effectively a solite with apatite, mica, magnetite, apatite, and so on and so on, and lots of minerals, and of course, monazite. And I was able to work out the kind of pyrogenesis. You go from calcite 1, which is a solite, pyrochlor, ferriclorophyte, calcite 2, calcite artesanite, pyrite, magnetite. And also, as you can see from the, from the resources, these resources again keep changing all the time. And of course, along the release of the answer will be completely different. 
But nevertheless, it will give you an idea of how giant this deposit truly is. And that's what the, some of the features that you can see here. And then you see that this is the upper dark cumulant, beautifully displayed here. And also, you have <coughs> sharp like textures of carbonatic ash. So, what we're looking at effectively is a kind of a Mar <coughs> Mars star volcano. I'll put this thing together. It's a Mars star di diatrium uh, formed by phreatomagnetic processes. And this is the cap. You see the, 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 the cap. And then you have the the, um, uh, the, the breccia here, and of course, oops, we keep doing this. And, and you have the um, uh, alluvium, the marginal breccia, vent partial breccia, that have been in the operation all round. Okay, let's move to Africa, which is, I, I think, Africa is the motherland of carbonatites. And as you can see, the carbonatite is just about everywhere, <coughs> particularly among in the East African Rift system, the East African Rift system. The one I was involved with are in Namibia and partly in Angola and also in South Africa. Along the Bushland complex, we have two, Bellini and Cliff Fontaine. They're interesting indeed, in addition to many others. And all of these, by the way, are roughly the same age of the Bushland complex. So they are associated with a large igneous plant, which is the Bushland complex in that case. This is to show very quickly the simplified geology of the Goudin carbonate complex, so that's from the Gibbon Birdwood. And again, I, I, I did the sample it uh, some years ago, and here again it shows beautifully well the invisible calcite spherules in a silicate medium. The Crit Fontaine carbonatite, I had the pleasure with one of my former students to examine this, and uh, it's essentially um, a carbonatite with some mineralization. And the mineralization is quite a mix. It looks like it is in a nitritic cap, but in fact it contains manganese, phosphorus, um, barium, zinc, and so forth. And the, 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 the exact origin of this mineralization is a bit controversial, but a model I put together was a hypogene model rather than a nitritic model um, with other thermal fluid moving along a called Tachuzan. By an novel, this is in China. I was there in 2008. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic. It's huge deposit, uh, needless to say. In fact, it's, I think it's one of the largest in the world. And in addition to, of course, red earth mill, it also has fluoride and magnetite. And in fact, in many cases, it is mined for fluoride and magnetite <coughs> rather than red earth. Um, look at the under the microscope. It's a fascinating site. Cancrinite, just for the general knowledge. And I was recently in my home country, and, uh, and uh, I was stunned to see that, in fact, there are carbonatites in Italy too, but something totally new to me. And uh, so I, I asked a colleague to show me around. Uh, he was very nice, and he did. And we went to um, this area here, down here, uh, where there is an east-west trending fracture, major structures are, and right here you have uh, a carbonatite volcano that was totally unknown to me, because I come from this country. And, uh, did my PhD thesis, as a matter of fact, in the, in the, in the, city, in the city here, totally uh, ignorant of the, of the Vulture uh, volcano. So let's look at that. That's what it looks like. It's, in fact, a set of old nested caldera. And this, this is a, a predominantly carbonatite volcano. Okay? And it was quite amazing to see that. And then what you see here is eight layers, tetra layers, carbonatite. Uh, cut by through the channel, okay, that's by the by, and then also the carbonatite lavina, and it's all carbonatite. Now, nearby this active venting, and I'll show you a movie clip of 30 seconds, if I may, uh, showing venting of carbon dioxide and H2S in a crater, and with emitting something like 500 to 750 tons a day, okay? That doesn't come into the carbon tax, of course. And that, uh, uh, or maybe it should, I don't know. You must ask the African about it. And, uh, and, and funnily enough, it's an ancient sacred site. It goes back to, to you know, almost 3,000 years. So everybody knew, but nobody knows about this except this guy and now myself and a few others. That's it. It's unknown. I'll show you a movie clip in a minute, which is really very interesting. Uh, movie clip is here. We'll come back to that. Afghanistan. Well, uh, this was a, a, a covered up volcano marked by a, a Russian geologist in 1978. He did a fantastic job. This is a, a kind of a simplified map. 
when you look at the, at the original map, which is conceivable from the website, this guy did an amazing, truly an amazing work. And he, he got it all together as a major Capital uh, uh, volcano with a mineralization associated with it. But of course, we think twice before going back down this map, right? Um, now, uh, I'm coming to the end. Uh, mantle dynamics and carbonides usually they take the form of rift fractures around the cratonic margin, and there's been several papers in that, in that direction. Um, then, uh, Crasco scale ducked out the bridge of that uh, schism, control the location of some of these rift fractures. Aspen spherics not rich in carbon, chlorine, chlorine, and start to penetrate the overlying subcontinental endospheric mantle, causing extensive metasomia. That's the key, because that's where carbonatites are formed. Metasomatized uh, subcontinental endospheric mantle partially melts, producing alkaline and carbonatized mantles. And this is a view, and the last cross section showing what happens. You've got to start with a high new. I'm going to go into the details of that, but essentially, what you do, you metasomatize, like I said before, the subcontinent of the sperma, and that's where the carbonides are formed. And the final slide shows the metal depicting the formation of refrigerated microbes. So you have this uh, carbonides rich zone, a zone, a huge zone of metasomatis, and then the rift system where you have formalized, carbonides, sunite, all these volcanoes which are exemplified beautifully well in the start of the rift system. Right. Thank you for your attention, but I'll go to the movie please. Don't go away. <laughs>